ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of Special Projects at The Block, and we're very excited to have Anatoly, co-founder of Solana, back on the show. I think, I, and I may be mistaken, the last time you were on, we unveiled or debuted Saga. We're going to talk about the progress, the bull, and the building that's happening within Saga and Solana as well. I, I'm pretty sure that was the last time, and obviously it was a it was an interesting market debut um, for the phone. And then I don't know something just happened. Breakpoint unlocked a degree of energy that unleashed the idea of Saga onto the world in a way that uh, maybe you didn't anticipate. I remember there was a podcast where you said you almost you almost kind of had a bit of a um, you were you were. Uh, bottoming it out in a sense but are we so back um so like the the plan or the big idea of this is that um apple and google they kind of they take too big of a cut from developers like 20 to 30 percent um that's a lot right we're you know crypto's talking about disrupting banks and finance and payments and they take like two percent at most and that's that's for that's for credit <laughs> credit like risk payments <laughs> right like on demand uh but mostly they even take smaller fees um and it seems absurd for me to think that crypto can disrupt the banking industry but can't disrupt or change the way that software is sold you know on the internet that's sold or distributed mm -hmm. um so kind of we had this idea that there's enough developer kind of pent up demand for an alternative app store that they're willing to basically create content that's exclusive for a different app store than they would for iOS and, and Android. And this works really well with crypto because the digital content that you create in crypto, you the users actually get to own it. They're not renting it. That's a very weird but subtle difference when you like buy a movie from iTunes or Prime, you don't own it. It's not your movie, you know? You can't resell mm -hmm. it. <laughs> you, you're kind of getting a, a rental lease from Amazon and Apple for as long as they'll honor it. And they'll probably honor it forever because it doesn't really cost them anything. But you don't actually own that movie. And this was a, this is something that slowly transformed kind of like, frog boiling in water from the 90s. We used to buy software in a box with a license key and you could sell it to a friend. And then everyone, like all the software producers like Microsoft, the big ones, didn't want you to do that. They really wanted you to buy it and then have your friend also buy it uh, for the obvious reasons because they want to make more money. Um, but there was this mm -hmm. weird shift where at some point everyone thought, well, I bought the CD and I can sell it and I own it. Or I bought this VHS tape and I bought this DVD and then you kind of lo lost control of, of your content and you're only renting it now. Um, and NFTs and kind of crypto is bringing that back, I think. Um, so because you can actually transfer and sell NFTs, there should be treated like physical goods, right? Uh, Magic Eden can't list a $10,000 NFT on their iOS app store for $13,000. That would be absurd, right? Like the users mm -hmm. would hate them. Like, why is this thing $13,000 mm -hmm. at Apple? Uh, no user is going to want to pay that markup. And Magic Eden can't eat that cost because they don't own the NFT. They actually are just a marketplace that has a listing from some random user that actually owns it. So they can't manufacture that content on demand at, at infinite capacity, right? And then eat the costs like you can with movies or whatever, or anything that you really license, you know, rent from, from the big app stores. So this is the, the dilemma that I, that Apple and, and Google face is that crypto kind of disrupts their business models. They're making a lot of money off letting people rent digital content <laughs> on their platforms and, and take 20 to 30%. And enabling like truly embracing crypto is going to disrupt it. And I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but if that's the case, then it presents an opportunity for somebody else to build an alternative environment. And that is such a huge, 
surprise. It's massive, right? This is like as big of leagues as you can get to <laughs> that even an infinitesimally small chance of success seems worth it. Um, so I kind of see this tiny wedge uh, for us to be able to squeeze in there and potentially build a alternative app store. So that seemed like the reason and the opportunity to do so. And it was a, a tough start. We announced Saga. We thought we could sell 25 to 50,000 devices. And on day one, we sold like, I think, 3,500. And then we were selling like mm -hmm. 30 to 40 a day, which is not a lot. It's a long way to get to, mm -hmm. to, to 25,000 at that pace. And I was almost like, kind of, we, we basically put the team in cockroach mode to see how long it can last and, and ship and uh, how long it can survive. And the thing that kind of brought it back to life was that one of the Solana ecosystem devs, the Bonk team, they, when Bonk was, when yeah. Bonk was super cheap, they like made an airdrop. I forget how much Bonk it was per device. I think it came out to like $600 per device. But at the start, it was only $10 worth. I, don't, I forget the number of Bonk it was, but it was like an infinitesimally small amount, <laughs> like 10 bucks. And it yeah. popped and users... Uh, what we noticed, at least the behavior, people thought that, oh, people are buying the device for the bonk. What we actually saw was that bonk... But it kind of just repriced the device, didn't it? Well, what we saw was that bonk users would sell their bonk and buy the device because they knew they were going to get it back. It wasn't that people were buying the device for the bonk because it's kind of a... Why wouldn't you just go buy the bonk versus buy this device? Wait two to two weeks to get it, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's a that's a less rational thing to do than if you already have the same amount of bonk and you're planning on holding it, you sell it and buy the device. So what we saw was we converted a lot of the bonk users into Saga device holders, um, and we kind of see potentially similar things happening with a bunch of other ones like Access Protocol and Saga Monkeys and a whole bunch of Clanosaurus and, and things like that, <laughs> is that people were able to, that wanted those digital assets were now incentivized to go figure out how to get the device and participate and start engaging with the app. I think the Bonk app is the most opened application on the Saga um, on the device, like 16,000 people it's fun. that installed it, <laughs> um, which is pretty high penetration. That's like 80% of the users, uh, out of 20,000. Do you, do you reckon Anatoly that it was less about uh, a financial incentive and more about being part of an extension of your community? Um, like you don't want to be the guy at the bonk meetup that doesn't have the saga yeah, basically or <laughs> right. Yeah, it is, is. Yeah, this is like the big, the big unknowns. Like, are these? How do these memes work? Are they digital communities? Like, is it just speculation? I kind of think that it's. Uh, there's an infinite number of ways to speculate in the world. I think the reason why memes are popular is because it's. Uh, it does create a community effect, which you don't get. Of, outside of very few stocks like Tesla or like few or like Bitcoin itself, right? Like there's there's a, sure. there's assets where people or like gold. There's like a meme around it, these things, and people that are super into collecting gold <laughs> meetups and talk about it. <laughs> so so those effects like ad, ad nauseum. Yeah, those effects occur, and I think you're kind of seeing them occur in, in the digital space now. I want to get your take on how you can leverage community to push Saga further, but I want to double click on this, this concept of memetics or meme coins because they've been making headlines quite a bit recently. I guess the question I would be cu curious to get your answer on is, d do you think that this is a phenomenon of uh, something that I've heard some folks describe as um, financial nihilism, this idea that you know, you're not going to really make it if you're a younger person. Uh, you can't even buy a house in, in, in many areas, uh, given interest rates and given the costs of real estate. Um, uh, I think there was a statistic uh, that an earlier guest of the show shared 
um, that I think in, um, you know, let's call it 1960, I'm not really sure of the year, unfortunately, uh, the average salary could buy 150 shares of the S&P and the equivalent today, you can only buy like uh, 10 shares of the S&P index. And so there's this real, uh, there's this sort of drive to YOLO and to meme coins because it, it's the only way to to GMI, right? Or is it, or is it something uh, I spoke with one of my colleagues this morning who kind of said, yeah, I kind of get that take, but it's really just, it's just fun. Like it's, it's fun to do. It's more similar to uh, less about uh, wanting to um, sort of fight the existing financial system and more about uh, the reasons why you join a social club or, or buy a certain pair of sneakers or something. I'm more in the latter camp. I'm not a nihilist. <laughs> I, <guess. laughs> I think people are doing it because it's fun. Uh, and there's some, we're spending so much more time online that this is where you start engaging in this activity. Um, I don't think, I don't know, tulip mania was that people like really thinking betting their finance. Some people might have, but like, I think a lot of people are just also probably mm -hmm. just having fun because it's still just tulips, mm -hmm. man. Just <laughs> like people weren't stupid back then. People weren't stupid <laughs> when they were buying Beanie Babies. They're like, yeah, this is a toy. Maybe there's a chance it could be worth something because somebody's Star Wars figurine is worth something or maybe not. Like it doesn't matter. But like, I think participating in the, in that in those markets is mostly people having fun. Um, I don't know. I'm an optimist, not a nihilist. <laughs> how do you think, how do you, how do you think a project like a bonk or any meme coin, um, are, are, are there still, um, is there still a, is there a playbook for success or maybe, uh, having it transcend, uh, the memory to something real <laughs> that memory. is contributing. Uh, I would say that like the one, the one thing that I saw work well were bonk and mad lads and whiff. And they were the least amount of focused on any kind of utility or transcending it to anything. It was just simply a meme. Like it's just people mm -hmm. having fun. Um, I don't know. This, this is, this is a good question. Like, I think I actually haven't seen any meme coin like transcend into something else and like survive that. <laughs> I think it's almost like as soon as it becomes something else, it's like, well, there's a million competitors to that thing. Is it going to be the best at it or not? Right. You start like comparing it on, on that utility versus like how funny or ironic it is that <laughs> it's, it's. Uh, well, then that raises the question, right? Then if, if Saga sort of in, in this later stage was able to boot, bootstrap itself off of a, a partial memory how does it then transcend to this more utility phase? Because, for instance, um, you know, well, I wasn't bringing my my saga around until it made me cool. Yep. Yeah. And then I was bringing it everywhere because I I need people to know that I have one. So that it's very important. That's that's all we can do. Like we can't beat Apple on hardware. We can't beat Google on software. We can we can do cool stuff like add deep in functionality and things like that, that are very like bespoke hardware. That's they're never going to do because it's too small of a market that we can do. But, um, it's really gonna, if it's going to succeed in, um, changing the equilibrium in the, in these big app store marketplaces, it's because of the creators that do these like wild things that somehow catch fire. Um, and that's really nonlinear and unpredictable. Like, there's no way I can predict, is there going to be another bonk? I don't know. Right. Like, um, it, it's, it's hard, but that's like probably the only chance for us to kind of change, uh, how these app stores function. I, I think when you first came on to talk about the rollout of saga, you, you did have this idea. Um, the, the, the sort of aspirations haven't really 
changed it from from what I've heard that this could replace someone's um, primary device. And I think recently you've maybe shifted um, in, in that thinking to this could be more of a crypto specific um, secondary device. Um, no, we don't. We don't, we don't want to build a smart wallet. Um, I think it's really so it's important same, that it can same, function as a same, daily driver. That doesn't mean that thinking. everyone's going to use it as a daily driver. Um, a lot of people have to have two phones because of work anyway. So like, there is a mm -hmm. segment of the population that already deals with multiple phones. But I think it's important that it has all the functionality of a daily driver. And it's kind of up to that specific user. Um, and if some users that are like, I don't know, don't have a, a job with, with a bunch of security things or whatever, right? They're like, don't have con other constraints that have put them into a specific spot. They use a, the Saga as their main phone. That's great. I, I wonder if you should try to, you know, get into some, as a strategy, uh, convince some crypto firms to uh, have Saga be the, the main work phone for those, for those companies if they issue them. It's kind of like a boomer thing though. I don't know if like, if <laughs> it could be like like stuff that we want to do is like add iris scanning and, and mm -hmm. things like that um again no guarantee that we can fit all this tech in the device or that the software can even leverage it but it could be like there is like an enterprise device mm -hmm. version of this where it gives you really strong biometrics civil resistance and you're you got you have this device as your authenticator when you're signing multisigs mm -hmm. and things like that, right? So not only is it doing verification that yeah I'm signing with this key, but also the user that you expect to use that key. Um, and given how crazy AI is getting, we might <laughs> that might become like a a real <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> Like you're so pixelated right now. You have, <laughs> I have no, no idea clue if it's the real. It could frame. be AI. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I absolutely may be AI. One day they're going to be able to replace the show with with a chat bot of sorts, and I'll just I think within six months. <laughs> hopefully not. We need. I, <laughs> I need to be retired by then. So Solana needs to be at at least a thousand before that. That would make sense. Um. So what's the plan? How did sort of this re, uh, this infusion of new energy in life? I feel like you mentioned the cockroach team. I feel like it was getting close to sort of uh, getting a bit doomy and gloomy, and then out of nowhere, it just obviously yeah had a major comeback. So how did that reconfigure the the goals, the thinking, the amount of resources you're you're putting into this? I gave the team kind of a, what I thought was an impossible goal. Like, mm -hmm. can they get like a hundred thousand pre-orders, <laughs> which I thought there's no way they can do it uh, because this was just a one-off. There's not a, that many people <laughs> that actually want this thing. And um, they launched a pre-order page. And I think within, the first th 30 hours, they had 30,000. And then by the end of the month, they hit 100K, yep. which is pretty crazy. Um, so 100K is a lot of units. That's like real, that's a real device. So they're now hustling to to build it as fast as they can and then like add all the features and everything. How Can you context contextualize that within um, the broader market, uh, maybe market share or? Is it like 0.001%? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think Samsung and Apple probably sell, between both of them, they've sold about <laughs> 6 billion devices. I think they sell like 20 million a year or something like that or some 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 big enough number. Um, so yeah, 6 billion devices. The probability of us disrupting the App Store before Saga was zero out of six billion, after V1 it was twenty thousand out of six billion, and now it's like one hundred twenty thousand <laughs> out of six billion. So the probability keeps increasing. It's still very small. <laughs> um, I think what most folks don't realize is that um, a single participant in this market could dr drastically change the equilibrium. 
because the the how do you mean how do you mean the really cool thing about crypto is that these are the most terminally online hyper connected people <laughs> that have the most expendable online income they have they effectively have their gaming cards preload, preloaded with a whole with mm -hmm. very large amounts of assets much more than a regular iOS user and maybe that's like 1% of the user base of iOS and, and Android are like crypto people, uh, like actives. Um, if we mm -hmm. can get that user base to move over to a different platform, that's a massive amount of spend, like revenue that's available to developers. And that's a much more lucrative distribution channel for them because they have a very target rich environment. Like I would rather build an app for that 1% of users than try to go find them through the massive distribution channel that Apple has. Like they don't really help you find your target user base. They just throw you in the app store and you, you fight it out with everyone else. So if we can create this alternative universe where you have crypto native, everything, everything works, there's no fees for devs. They build these use cases and applications and games and whatever that are engaging. And we start actually shifting people over. I suspect that at some point you'll see the the app stores change their policies, probably well before. But this is at a point where even if we have one percent of market share, mobile is massively successful. Successful, <laughs> right? Like so. Well, I, I I I think that I appreciate your sense of humor about the the extent to which this is <laughs> an extreme moonshot that the hardware will be. Um, ever reach the success of, of the two of the duopoly that exists in our world. But let's maybe shift from the hardware side to the actual, you know, software side. Uh, I want to say a large part of just this push is, is kind of, obviously there's saga as sort of maybe a, 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 a uh, an experiment, right. With, with, um, with not a lot of, you know, there's some aspirations there, but it's not necessarily, the be all end all let's talk a bit about the developments happening on the uh sort of uh tooling side of the equation and how you guys are helping equip developers in building these apps that work and users find delightful and are crypto native um yeah this is a, how are you measuring the success there a huge part of this is uh that we don't have to do this alone. This is kind of the cool thing is that mm -hmm. basically you have folks like Mert, like Helios, they've built all the APIs for every NFT in every way you can imagine. Uh, Metaplex have built all the minting software. All that stuff is works and there's no restrictions on how to use it. So developers can actually go like use the existing Solana ecosystem APIs and go have a ball underground protocol i think was first to go build all the apis necessary for devs to airdrop all the saga holders and track all the rewards and things like that for users um so the cool thing is that we're already seeing that like our tiny company right like labs i think is like 40 people half of that is mobile so 20 people taking on the duopoly mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't actually have to do all the work uh, which is cool. And we're seeing the ecosystem already kind of be very hungry in terms of like providing the infrastructure tooling and devs actually taking advantage advantage of it. So that's been one of the bets that we thought if if there's if there's a way for us to succeed, it's because we don't have to do it all. Like we actually have a, a strong enough ecosystem to where once they see that opportunity, they'll start kind of building a ton of the the tooling for us sort of speaks to um, the backdrop of the way in which the Solana ecosystem is 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 decentralizing uh, from a not from a technical perspective but more from a a a, um, a contributor perspective um, I'm, obviously I'm a shit manager I just don't want to manage anyone <laughs> so if there's a way that an external team can go build something I'm like <laughs> God bless them. I'll, I'll, so what I'll, do you think the future of looks looks like in terms of uh you know Solana five years from now? How many how many 
derivatives or iterations of labs, foundation, et cetera, could there be? What's a derivative or, I, I mean, there's only one labs and one foundation. I think that's probably going to stay true. Just their scope keeps um, kind of reducing. Like you see folks that are like really good operators that like Maddie joined foundation and he built the entire hackathon program. And now he's mm -hmm. launching his own thing called Coliseum on top of it. So this has been kind of our MOs. Anyone that yeah. joins Solana Labs or Foundation, there's a real culture of entrepreneurship that if you build something, you really you really want to own it, we'll help you, right? Like go go raise capital, go be the CEO of that thing, go have a ball. <laughs> so that that's been I guess I mean when will the when will the when will sort of the the epicenter of uh, innovation or contribution for Solana, could it ever move away to someone else? I mean, that already has, I think, for even the core client, Anza is a separate, is, is outside of labs. I can't fire anyone there. Um, and a lot of the ideas on performance optimizations are coming from Firedancer, so not even from... Yep. The people that I originally hired, <laughs> it's it's now like different different teams. Like the folks that have proposed the probably the biggest change, I would say, to the economics, the SIMD one ten, which is like you can think of it as one five five nine, but for state. Uh, that came from Ellipsis, the guys that built Phoenix, the the super efficient central limit order rug. Also, mm -hmm. totally separate team. So we're kind of seeing that already happening. Um, again, um, it's awesome because I feel like I'm being lazy. I'm not, I'm doing, <laughs> I don't have to do anything and just things are happening on their own. Um, but it's also like, I find that uh, there's still kind of a, a role for me to play as a, almost like the classic L8 engineer is like, you go talk to a bunch of teams, mm -hmm throw a proposal in front of them. They look up from their desk, right, for that one second and then give you a thumbs up or thumbs down. You try to get consensus across the of the ecosystem on, on what should be done. When you think back over the past year, right, I mean, performance um, has really improved. Um, I think we, we put out a report recently that I think there was only maybe one issue over the past year, over the past 12 months. Um, there's been a lot of building in the background. Why do you think maybe some folks were taken by surprise by that? Um, that I don't know. I mean, like anyone that was deep in the weeds with us kind of could see that every release mm -hmm. is better. And like, um, I don't know, I guess I'm in a, a bit of an <laughs> echo chamber because like the feedback that I'm getting is like, yeah, <laughs> one, one is I see like the feedback that I get is either from people that only see mm -hmm. the positives or from people that are always complaining about like all the stuff that still hasn't been fixed. <laughs> so, so I see both of the extremes, but even the people that complain about the stuff that hasn't been fixed yet, um, they see the progress. So delineate for us how we continue this progress over the next six to 12 months. Obviously, everyone's excited about Fire Dancer. Uh, what other things are maybe you personally excited about? Um, I mean, I think the we had like a cool... Well, maybe not everyone. ETH Maxis might not be excited about it. But. <laughs> I think the coolest, the, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, the one of the most interesting changes is this idea of having a dynamically priced access to state. Um, so Solana mm -hmm. has this idea of localized fee markets and um, that was shipped like a year and a half ago and it, it worked really well to stabilize demand, like how to manage the transaction flow in the network. And you see prices spiking for certain parts of the state, but not for the entire block. Um, but we still have this like adverse effects from um, it's almost like you got, you got to think of it as, uh, as three dimensional fees. You have your mm -hmm. state, unlike, unlike Ethereum, where you only have one dimension, one dimensional fees, you're paying for access in the next block. 
Solana actually, because it's so fast, you have a block every 400 milliseconds, you're paying for priority access of so time preference to be earlier in the block queue. And your, and your probability of inclusion is kind of this geometric function that increases with every leader. So if in the span of one block that you see in Ethereum, you actually get 10 different block producers in Solana to try to include your transaction. And the probability of that is based on your priority fee that you're paying and the state that you're accessing. So if you're accessing the hottest, most contentious state, you got to pay highest to be earliest. But it's three-dimensional kind of optimization problem, which is um, really hard, even for... Yeah, won't, won't the skeptics say, what's the difference? You know, you're just kind of making it cost more at a certain time versus... Well, the difference all the time, I guess. The difference is that you need it's the only way you can deal with these problems is isolation. And this is where Ethereum L1 breaks down is that if there's a NFT mint and a ape airdrop and a liquidation, all of those are competing for inclusion in the block and they're all fighting each other to be first. Mm -hmm. And this causes the price for inclusion in that block to go up dramatically versus like, I'm a user, I want to pay a fairly low fee and I don't care if I go into this block or a block 400 milliseconds from now and I'm not touching the NFT mint or the liquidation or any of that. So just include me, right? Like as when, when you get around to it. Um, so that reduces the cost of fees by isolating all the different use cases from each other and giving users this like ability to kind of pay for time preference. Um, but what you end up seeing is that because the baseline fee is so low um, and there's DeFi on the chain, I can basically construct mm -hmm. a transaction that does a complicated trade and makes a dollar and I can, but it fails 9,000 times in a row and I submit it 10,000 times. Right. And it succeeds, you know, like one of those times I'm in the profit because it cost me one ten thousandth of a dollar to submit it. And I just spam the network and that strategy that triangulates the state and succeeds one in 10,000 times is creates a massive amount of load in comparison to like a user that's just minting an NFT or just sending a payment. Um, so the idea with these 1559 style state fees is that because all of these DeFi transactions are basically all triangulating around a few mm -hmm. markets, even if they touch other ones, those markets become hot and the, the fee to access those goes up. And if the fee to access those goes up by a factor of 10, now that strategy that requires nine... 1,999 failed transactions for one to succeed and make a dollar is no longer profitable. I have to find a strategy that only has a thousand transactions, right, to make a dollar. So now I've reduced the network load by a factor of 10. That ARB is still going to get taken. Just the sender that's now running that yeah. bot has to go do more work, figure out how do I only submit this thing a thousand times at the right time, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So this will like slowly turn- Which puts, turn, puts less load right. on the whole system. So that's kind of like probably the biggest change that's coming to Solana economics. And this was developed by a different team. This was like Phoenix, the Phoenix guys, mm -hmm. Jerry and, and um, Eugene. They're, I would say like, um, they would have been EVM maxis had Solana not existed. <laughs> so there's like <laughs> there's like a con there's like a group of folks that are super smart that like don't particularly like the the Ethereum roadmap, but were Ethereum enthusiasts that have now become like Solana mm -hmm. enthusiasts. Uh, so we found our people that are like doing all the research and and uh, pushing the chain into the right direction. How do you see Solana? Um, penetrating the real world um, outside of mobile in terms of improving, you know, existing apps or um, business uh, types? How do you see it changing the world and outside of finance as well? I think um, 
people often like think of growth as immediately replacing something that it's competing with. Um, so like, yeah, when Amazon came out, you could see the writing on the wall for borders and, and, uh, all the bo bookstores. Right. But it's not going to happen overnight. Even if Amazon grows, it's actually going to grow. Who's the, who's the borders in this Solana analogy and the <laughs> Barnes and Nobles? We're talking about existing financial it, ecosystems, like whether it's the banks or whatever, yeah. or the credit card payment, or the, even writing somebody writing a check, like these. Yeah. Okay. Now, who's the what way of engaging doing commerce, right. uh, even if it's not specific businesses? And then who's the who's the Walmart and Target? The so, like I would say, the banks are probably the biggest, slowest movers that have the least amount of incremental like iteration speed and all these businesses have been built on top of them that add a feature that the banks can't do themselves like visa and they're moving much much faster but i'd imagine mm -hmm. that like visa shopify none of those guys really want to have a dependency on a bank they'd rather have a dependency on a token on usdc or mint their own and then do everything mm. that they're doing just without the extra intermediaries and capture more of the market and grow faster and iterate faster. So my view is that like kind of the slowest iterating part of the financial stack is going to get removed and replaced by stable coins. This is where I think like crypto will transform the world um, probably the fastest, but it's going to take time and slow and it's actually going to grow in areas that are probably not mainstream yet, like digital online spending for NFTs or whatever, or cross border, like product launches. Like we launched Saga with a Shopify plugin that was credit card or USDC. Half the users self-selected to send us USDC, mm -hmm. didn't get any discounts or anything like that. So you already see that behavior kind of slowly changing, but in niche spots, like, right. If you, Probably if you change your bookstore right now to take USDC, your number of users that would use it is going to be much smaller than 50%. Um, but that's kind of like what I think is going to, where you're going to see growth is in all the traditional areas. And it's obvious, yeah, no one's going to want to use a bank <laughs> to facilitate credit up to a credit card and have <laughs> them take their cut and all this other stuff. You're going to use a stable coin and you can just issue it directly and pay to the merchant. It'll be instant. Uh, but that's going to take time. I think kind of there's this probably like expectation, but no credible plan that within five years, you're going to see a trillion worth of stable coins issued across all the networks. Like would like you would agree with that, right? As a very likely outcome. That's, cra yeah. that's crazy, right? But just think about the massive amount of, of wealth that's going to be created as that process is happening and all the businesses that are going to be transformed by it. Um, but it's still... It's just easier. Right. I mean, it's literally just easier. If, it, if you've ever tried to do anything. Yeah, if you've ever, you ever been a developer and used like the best version of FinTech... <laughs> and then just built like a hook to process a, a USDC payment, it's night and day. <laughs> yeah, it, it it is. And 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 I think it's like, I was talking with one of our new employees about this um, cause he, because he came from the FinTech world. Um, and it's like, it, it, and we've talked about this on the show before, they're, they're basically trying to create something new with something old or within something new. And crypto is trying to do something new with something new, which is just, it's operating completely different within completely different parameters um, in terms of friction and, and the rest. So what happens to fintech in this? I mean, the, the th in this crypto $1 trillion stable coin issuance world. It will like Shopify works great with USDC. Go use the Solana Shopify USDC plugin. It's awesome. It's super easy to set up. <laughs> Everyone's happy. <laughs> <laughs> Shopify probably makes more money on that plugin because 
they don't have to deal with all the crazy credit card processing rules. Mm-hmm. What happens to credit cards? I would imagine that as soon as it's feasible, Visa would also just re- layer everything with a token. And then the bank is what, what gets um, kind of cut out of the, mm-hmm. of the loop. All right, sir. Well, we appreciate you taking the time. Anything else you want to add or anything you want to point listeners to? Help us to take down the duopoly. Go pre-order Solana mobile phone. <laughs> yeah, be part of the cool club kid, uh, cool kid club. Perfect. <laughs> I was supposed to go to a quack happy hour today, but the the uh, it's raining quite heavy down here in Jersey, so uh, I might not make it. But if I were to go, I would have to have my have to have my saga sure. on me. There's not that much crypto on it, so if anybody, you know, don't try to kidnap me. (laughs) There's just the quack. (laughs) Thanks for taking the time, Anatoly. All right, man. Take care.